Hi everyone, I'm Deborah Weeks. I'm here at Mud Burbank doing the Mud Talks in association with Makeup Artists Magazine. I'm here with my friend Michelle Burke, who is one of my favourite makeup artists in the world, who's done some of the greatest makeups mm. that have shaped and formed, and, it, and even being a non makeup artist, you express so much of, of, of what I think great makeup artistry is. And you have an amazing story. Um, we're going to just jump straight in. Yeah. Um, Oh, let me just say this. Michelle is a two-time Oscar winner. You're the first woman to win an Oscar. Yeah. And that was, was that the second Oscar second ever? Second Oscar ever given. Wow. <clears throat> Isn't that for something? makeup, yeah. I know. Second so weird. And how was it when you got that nomination? What was that experience? Well, the weird part was, I was up in Canada at the time. I'd never been down here to Hollywood or anything. And I'm Irish, I'm a great at there. And <clears throat> when the production manager called me, and it was like many months after the film, he called him and said, hey, Michelle, you're nominated. I said, well, what does that mean? Is it good, bad, what? He started to laugh, you know. And I said, what are you laughing at? He said, for an Oscar, stupid type of thing, you know. And I didn't, I didn't quite understand the whole thing. I didn't know what it was about. I was completely out of the loop. It was not something on my radar, you know what I mean? And so uh, it was very strange. You, know? you have a story that I love, <clears throat> that uh, you should jump in. It Who has... gave you your Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, what happened was when I got nominated, I didn't think much of it because I wasn't aware of Oscars, the Academy, that stuff. It was not something I thought of. So I took this film called The Iceman and the producers, when they called me up to do it, and I really wanted to do it because it was about this Neanderthal found in ice and they thawed him out and the whole thing. And I really wanted to do it. And they said to me, look, if you take this film, you're nominated for an Oscar. It means you cannot leave the set at all to go down to Hollywood because it would be a three day event because we're way up. We were up at the polar bears so north up in Canada, like literally in tents at the edge of glaciers some of the time. And they said, you can, we can't get you out of there or in if there's a fog and then we need you. We can't we can't. So I said, no, 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 we're not going to win because we were up against Gandhi. So I said it was like the big popular film of the day where they all wore togas and pushed his ear forward and gave him tanners, you know. And I said, no, no, they're going to win because it's the most popular film. So I'm going to, I want to do Iceman. It's much more important to me. And of course, sure enough, we won. It was like weird. And so in the end, <clears throat> the Academy sent me a letter saying, well, we'll just mail you the Oscar. And I thought, perfect. This, you know, can arrive in the mail. Then cut to, it was many months after that. And I was in Toronto, it was kind of a summery day. My sister was visiting and we were kind of in cutoffs and t-shirts and the note came in, <clears throat> go down to the post office, you've got to go through, go to the customs area and claim a package. So I thought, perfect, this is it, you know. So we go down and the postman comes out with this kind of coffin-like rectangular box and Oscars are heavy, they're about 12 pounds, believe it or not, they're heavy. So he comes out with this big box and this is what, uh, Late 70s, is it? Maybe? No, um, early, late 80s. <clears throat> early 80s. Early 80s. Early 80s. And, you know, drugs and all this stuff was a big deal. So he's coming out of the box and he says, I've got to check this out and open it. And I, and he put it down on the counter and I said, open it. And he opens up the box and he goes in and he goes, oh, it's an Oscar. And then he gets the thing up the card and he says, Michelle Burke, are you Michelle Burke? And I said, yes. And my sister said, well, present her with it, for goodness <laughs> sake. And, and, you know? and at this point, there's kind of people around going, what's going on here? And he then becomes very solemn, and he kind of goes like this. And, 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 and he gets the box like this, and he goes <laughs> across the counter, right? So there I was presented with my first Oscar by a postman, you know, it was like perfect, you know. Um, you said you were born in Ireland. Mm -hmm. What was your childhood like growing up? At the time, it seemed completely normal because normal is normal till you realize, looking back, it was abnormal. But I'm one of 10, second oldest. And it was, you know, an unconventional sort of wild, crazy family in a way. And I had, six brothers and then my sisters came along. So basically I grew up with brothers. And so, and we lived in the country, a town called Kildare, <clears throat> which is not far from Dublin, but still the country. And so I really had to 
kind of fight my corner with the boys, which was actually good because I learned a lot by doing that. And we had a, there was a cinema not far, like next door to our house actually. You know, it was a big wall, a cinema. And quite often we would sneak in and see them shooting bits and pieces. And most of the time there were horror films and stuff. But I think that's where my early, very early memories of it was like the mummy and, you know, swamp this creature from the Black Lagoon and all this stuff kind of st and st stuck in my mind, you know. And uh, then, I mean, it was a kind of a, a nutty bring upbringing because, you know, babies kept arriving and my mother became overwhelmed. So uh, I was sent to a boarding school in Dublin because it became easier to cope with the older children by shipping them off, you know, as opposed to not having them, I don't know. <clears throat> and so uh, I did that, but the, my father was very influenced by film, which was great. And he, he was involved in the horse racing business and I was a big horse rider and loved riding horses and stuff. And I actually wanted to be a jockey, believe it or not, uh, which was crazy because I just would not have, it wouldn't have worked out for me, you know. And my mother was very artistic and a very, very kind person. And she always more or less goaded me on to be independent and to uh, have a different life, you know, to, to kind of hers, she was really trying to say, you know. But my father introduced me to film and also to art. And it was really great because a lot of times, if ever we had to go to Dublin for something, he would always take me to some of the art galleries. And there's some great artists in Ireland. and through looking at art and talking to him about art, I learned a lot and it became my first kind of trigger. And I, of course I was good at art, so that was important as well. And then at boarding school, which was this Sacred Heart boarding school, all girls, nuns of course, um, <clears throat> I think uh, I just wasn't that suited to the that life because at the time, and now I look back, I realize I'd, I, I had dyslexia, but no one knew what the hell that was. And because of that, I was very uh, ill at ease with certain subjects. I was great with languages and art, of course, and sports, but maths, I could barely add two and two. Uh, numbers were always very, very hard for me. So I became distracted and I realized that I was uh, not happy there and I was even the nuns were saying to my parents that I was not academically bright enough to continue so my mother decided well the simplest thing to do then is make her learn a language and we'll ship her off to a, another draconian school off in Alsace in France to learn how to speak French and then she'll get a secretarial course and she'll get a job and get married and have kids so it was all pretty much the way society was back then, you know. So then I went to the school in France and that was a very, uh, probably traumatic experience in a way because I was dumped in there to the school in Alsace right at the border with Germany and no one spoke English. So I was really swimming, you know, and most, I knew the girls would ignore me if I didn't quickly learn how to speak because they were like, well, she doesn't speak so, you know. So anyway, so I learned French, but the interesting part with being there was that I realized that if I can speak fluent French, I can't be as stupid as they all think I am back there. So I'm going to prove to them that I'm not stupid. So after being there and learning French really well, I then, when that time ended, I went back to Ireland to another school and finished up my exams to, which were like more like your SATs or something. And I actually got honors in Germany, of course, French, and art. So I got three honors, which was good, because if you get three honors, that's a great thing. And I think, well, not, maybe English. You know, so suddenly I thought, well, that's not too bad. And then I thought, well, why don't I be a UN interpreter? <laughs> and so I decided I'd go and learn Spanish. So I went to Spain and studied, took foreign studies, art and art history and stuff at the university there for students. They have these courses. And I was there for three years and learned Spanish. So then I thought, perfect. I've got three languages. I'll be able to get a job as a, an interpreter or something, which was stupid because I don't have the mind to simultaneously listen to one language and quickly spit it out in the other. I just, it doesn't work like that. And so, but in Ireland, 
uh, things were going really bad with my family and also the, the economy, the IRA were lopping bombs at England and things were really rough and so to go work in England was not an option. And there was no work in Ireland and my father had pretty much gambled and drank the family fortune away so there wasn't anything, there were no resources with the family to fall back on, you know, or whatever. And so uh, my mother kept urging me to go get out there and find your fame and fortune. And I was only, I think at this point, 23. But I'd already blazed trails for myself in Spain, having gone there hardly knowing anybody, just by tutoring English to keep myself alive. And then she said to me, well, why don't you and your older brother emigrate to either Australia or Canada? And then I'll follow out with the rest of the kids and maybe that'll save the day, you know, save the family. So we both applied to either emigrate to Australia or Canada. And we said, okay, whoever applies first gets us, right? So uh, Canada replied first. So Canada got me. So we go to Montreal. And it was there that really, uh, you know, I got, of course, I got a job working in a very hip restaurant a bar called the Rainbow Bar and Grill serving drinks as a cocktail waitress but it was a very hip cool place at the time and uh, I learned a lot about the made a lot of great friends and connected and I made a friend with this girl whose family were in the fur business and they put on a lot of these fashion shows you know like um, big f fur fashion shows and stuff and she said to me Michelle why don't we put on our own fashion show with like vintage clothing and do stuff like that. And we were all into vintage clothing because it was the cheapest way to clothe ourselves with these second hand clothes was really the way it went. And so we uh, decided we were going to put on this fashion show. And she was much more savvy than me. I'm just trotting along behind her going, oh, really? What do you do? And so uh, she said to me, Michelle, we ha we're going to need a makeup artist. And I was like, really? What's that for? And she said, well, to get the girls' makeup. I said, well, can't they put their own makeup on? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, 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 You've got, we, we need a makeup artist. So she, um, she knew all these people, you see. She was connected like that. I was, I'm like the follower. And so on the day of this show, it wasn't a big show, but nonetheless, she had managed to pull, because she was more a society person, and managed to pull together all these people. Uh, a few days before, in comes this makeup artist, and he... Uh, She's interviewing him, like to see if he wants to do the job. And he comes in with this portfolio because back then there were no, you know, we didn't have social media. Uh, we didn't have emails. We didn't have Instagram. None of that stuff existed. And your only way to show yourself off as a makeup artist or anybody was to show your portfolio and give your card. That's the only way you could do it. So he said, would you like to see my portfolio? And <clears throat> we were like, oh, yes, of course. And I hadn't a clue what he was trying to show us. And so uh, he start, as he was turning the pages, it was, it was like some sort of bolt hit me. It was like this, I didn't know you could do this, you know. And at the time, I thought this was a hobby, not a career. And so later, I called him up and I said, look, I love this idea, the transformation, the, the fact that in comes someone looking like this, just a normal girl, and then with makeup, they look like this high fashion model. How do you, you know, like a Vogue cover? I said, I want to learn how to do that. And so he told me where I could get this like um, quick course, a six week course in beauty. You know, we learn how to paint uh, butterflies, but also how you learn how to correct makeup, you know, with green corrector and stuff like that, like really ancient stuff, heavy grease paint and everything. And so I did the six week course and I thought, well, I'm going to do this because it's a hobby, you know, like for fun, kind of an arty thing. And uh, but as I when I did it, I was completely obsessed. I loved it. It was like so exciting. And <clears throat> then I heard about that actually uh, Revlon were looking for demonstrators in the department stores. And any, you know, they were looking for people. And so I applied. I thought, what the hell, I might as well go and say I want the job and I got a job doing, being a demonstrator so I was thrilled you know they put me up on this podium and I would do makeovers on people I mean they were oh I don't know how those women walked away with what I did on them I mean I, you know, I was like <laughs> blue and you know I'd put green corrector I mean they looked like dra you know f vampires when they left some of them but 
the, the thing about it was, and the thing about what you all know is, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And I had tons of people all day long doing makeup on them. So little by little, I got to know what they liked, what they disliked. And we, I was very busy at the time taking uh, that heavy um, early 70s, 60s makeup off people, which was a lot of pale blue and frosty eyes and strange looking eyeliners and making things look a little bit more natural and stuff. So I learned a lot. I mean, it was like really learning a lot. And I was very excited. And uh, what the funny part was that they had a kind of a commentator. Back then it was all very slick in the department store. He had a suit on and his guy called Risto would swish in. I think he was hung from hungry, you know, with the lapel and looking very beautiful. And he would say, and this is our international makeup artist. And I'm thinking, <laughs> they only knew, you know. But then I got the job, uh, I, I found, I heard about this place called Electa and Corrado, and they had this beautiful boutique. There were a couple, Electa and her husband, Corrado, and they were the top fashion go-to makeup artists in Montreal. They did all the fashion spreads. They had a great boutique where you did makeovers by appointment, and you sold makeup there. And so I got a job with them, and their makeup line literally is a precursor to MAC. Like that look that MAC has, was literally copied and plagiarized by them with no name, you know, at the time. But their makeup to this day, I mean, I have some of it and the pigments are as good as the day, you know, beautiful colors and really strong pigments. And so uh, again, I began to get my chops better and little by little they began to send me out on jobs, magazine covers, we would go do fashion shows. And so I really uh, was besotted by makeup. And even at the time, I didn't think this is really a true career. This is just something I'm, I'm loving so much that I don't even care what it, what it is. It's just really great fun. And, but then, unfortunately, one day I found this book called uh, Stage Makeup by Richard Corson. I don't know if you all know that book. But it was, in fact, you should get those books because <clears throat> Richard Corson wrote the Bible on hairstyles, period stuff, makeup. I mean, his, his books are to this day as good as anything and you don't need any other book but just his and when I'm looking at these books I'm thinking I don't know how to do these agings and all these subtle things that are in the books and fake noses and I thought I'm not a true makeup artist so then I began to ask around where can I learn this because there's no school no schools no supply houses nothing in Montreal at the time so um, I heard about this old-timer makeup artist called Mickey Hamilton and she was French Canadian, crusty, older. And I literally called her up, asked her, could I meet her? And she said, yes. And I literally asked her, could I work for her? For nothing, whatever it took, I will work with, with her to learn. So she looked at my stuff. At this point, I had a portfolio and she said, okay, I'll take you on, but I'm not going to pay you anything. And uh, you can sleep on the floor of my house if you want, you know, because where she lived and where I lived, it didn't work to be anywhere else. <clears throat> so I slept on her floor and we worked um, three films together. And she was really hard on me, I mean, really hard. And she uh, made me literally do all her work, you know, while she sat back. She, I mean, she did her work, but she may, she pushed me very, very hard. But, and I loved every moment. I've never resented, it was so exciting. But the big part was that I learned how to be on a film set. I learned about continuity and I learned the ways and how to do stuff. And she really taught me an awful lot. And really, uh, it's thanks to her that she got me into film. And then little by little, I began to uh, start trying to find films of my own to do after that. And I began to network with other people. And networking is super important. And knowing other people and being friends with other people is super important. So. Um, I, I, oh, and also at the time in Canada, they were doing, they started the tax breaks. So films were coming in, a lot of low budget horror films pretty much, to Canada because of the tax breaks. And I began to, and they, you know, they only had a very small amount of makeup artists there. So the, there were no makeup people. So I just literally would uh, find out where the film's production house was. I'd go in with my resume. <clears throat> asked to see the production manager and see if he wanted to see my portfolio and asked him could I get the job. And a lot of the times I did get the job, which was weird. I mean, here I am heading up a department 
never done it before and learning on the job was, was what I did. And <clears throat> I teamed up then with Stefan Dupuy. I don't think you ah, know him. He's Oscar winner. He, yeah, he, he later became an Oscar winner for The Fly. And he's a very good makeup artist. He was a wonderful sculptor. Uh, he came more from the sculpting end of things. And I came more from the makeup end of things. So <clears throat> we teamed up and we began to do, we were the go-to lab. We had a great lab in old Montreal, the go-to lab for all the horror films that came into town. And even when uh, Dick Smith came into town to work on Scanner and stuff, he would use our lab as his drop point, you know. And so we would then get tips from him and learn an awful lot. So we were really learning as we went. And also the big thing was that we were beginning to find out where do you get stuff, you know, because the labs, uh, most of our stuff was from dental supplies. There were no supply houses. And we'd get cement from the builders to make our ultracal molds and things like that. And at that point, foam latex was the the thing. There was no gelatin. There was a, we, didn't use, oh, we did lose gelatin, but not much. But there was no silicone or anything. It was all foam latex. And even then, <clears throat> most of the time, it didn't turn out right. It was it didn't get spongy and it was very hard to work with. But I learned so much just doing that. That's where I learned my, got my chops basically. And you really can't, uh, you know, when you can, I mean, what you have to do now is get as much work as you can, however you can, no matter what it is, because it's by working and doing that you're going to learn, you know, be, and then <clears throat> shortly after that, I get the call for Quest for Fire. So <clears throat> that was the big. So your first big film yeah. was Quest for Fire, oh, which yeah. you won an Oscar. Yes, <laughs> I know. Crazy. I know. Yeah, it was. And, and it was I, the times too, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? It was just yeah. different things, you but know. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen Quest for Fire, Quest for Fire is an enormous movie on every level. I mean, how, what countries did Before you shoot Before you're in? all born. <laughs> <laughs> but you should rent it because it was a really, it's a really unique film. You know, it has these uh, mud characters and Neanderthals and no one speaks in it, but it's a really kind of a revolutionary film and it's packed with makeup. I mean, it's overwhelming, you know, and we shot in Africa. We, we stayed in tents with the Maasai at one point. You know, we shot in Northern Canada. It was, oh, in England. It was really exciting. I mean, it was every day just super exciting. You know, Did you know this was your destiny then, that this was what you were going to do? Oh, I was besotted. I didn't care about the money. I didn't care about anything. And I never, you know, back then we're all, we were in our own little world. I, for me, this was just one big, great adventure. I never thought much further than that. It was just very exciting. You know, I just loved, uh, at one point I was telling Devil, uh, we were, you know, you're filthy from being in Africa, like the dirt, the dust all day long. It's It's very rough. And... We, at one point, we were in the Rift Valley where we had to be flown in to the, in these little weird wonky planes. And we stayed with the Maasai on their land for two weeks. And we just slept in tents. But the big thing was the crew just got one bucket of water a day to work with. That's all each person got because water was very short. So it's a little bucket. It's not a big American bucket. It's a little bucket like this. And they had built these uh, like shower stalls and they were wooden and uh, you could, it was kind of only basically it just covered your privates literally because your shoulders could be seen, your feet could be seen from outside and everything. And they put the, bu you put the bucket up on a hook and somehow it was worked that if you pull the rope, you, wa the water spilled down. But the trick was you had to pull the rope with only a tiny bit of water, soap up quickly, and then the rinse was the last pull, but if you didn't get it, then you're just sticky soapy for the rest of the night, you know. <laughs> and so it was quite a feat. Uh, meanwhile, it's because it's the end of the day and we've been shooting, it's nighttime and you can hear roar and lines roaring and crickets and all these noises from the jungle, you know, and you feel so vulnerable, you know, maybe a python will slither in here or something, you know, it's like really exciting and i thought this i really loved it, it was i don't know why i found it so exciting you know well it's also because you go from that and then would you share because you shared this earlier but why did you feel you had to come to hollywood i well you know i'd been doing pretty well in canada as you can tell and i was getting a lot of great calls for films and everything but 
I really felt that, you know, when I won my first Oscar, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm not worthy of that whole thing. And also maybe it was just a fluke, you know, just I just stumbled upon it. And I, it was so early in my career, it just didn't seem real. I, it didn't seem like I, I should have won this thing. And so I thought, well, the only way to really prove myself to myself, because that's all it is, it is you're always measuring against yourself, really. You should never compare with other people. I thought, I better come down and face the beast just to see, can I make it? And that's when I decided, OK, I'm going to come down here and see how can I, can I make it. And you started again. So you I weren't in the just, union, but you were an Oscar winner who wasn't in the union. Yes, so exactly. how long did it take you to get in the union here? It took uh, probably about two years. I had to kind of revert back. I, you know, I began to um, uh, work on a lot of low-budget films again. Uh, I had to kind of network again. I didn't know many people. I knew other makeup people. And... Uh, you know, people knew me, I would apply for stuff, but then they were like, well, you're not a union, how do we, you know, there's all this stuff. And finally I got a film, I think it was LBJ, about Lyndon Bird Johnson. And somehow it went union, uh, you know, they had organized it to go union. And that's how I got in. But it's very important to get into the union because uh, you get the top tier films by being in the union. Also you get your health benefits and you get a lot of, you get your pension. There's a lot of things that are practical about being a makeup artist that you have to think about. You know, um, for me, I never thought about those things, but when I heard other makeup people talk about it being so important, and now that I've reached this point in my life and I have great health benefits, retirement fund, uh, made some money because you got to save, uh, I realized, wow, had I not been in the union, I wouldn't have had all this stuff. So it is important. Um, of course, you can have a great career doing fashion and all the other things, but somehow it's important that even if you're not in the union, that you take care of that stuff because eventually, you know, you get older and you've got to think about it. So, um, and also too, most of the time you're working freelance. I mean, even if you're on a series and they keep picking you up, you, you never know if you're going to get fired or if your job is going to last. So you've got to be very practical and save and live s small. Don't start buying big houses or something because you're working with a star because you can be dropped like that. And you've got to really know your place and how you fit into the whole thing, you know. And so um, it was important, you know, to get into the union. <clears throat> how, how, did the co how did Interview with the Vampire come about for you? It... Uh, well, at that point, uh, I was uh, I had been nominated and I had won an Oscar for Dracula. And I was at the Oscars and Neil Jordan, the director, is Irish. And someone said to me, oh, and I'd read the books. I was crazy about it. Anne Rice and the vampire. I just love her stuff. And I really wanted to do his film and I knew he was going to direct it. And I said to somebody who knew him, please introduce me to him. You know, I just want to be introduced to him. So when we were introduced, I said to him, Neil, I know you're doing an interview with the vampire. I'd love to work on it. And he said, you got the job. Oh, <laughs> so that's kind of how, so, yeah. So I walk away holding my Oscar, having my night. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, I got this job, you know. And I was so excited. I wanted, because I wanted to do a different vampire to the Dracula, because, you know, Dracula was such a different look. And the description of Anne Rice's vampires was completely different, you know, the translucent skin. I wanted the challenge of the translucent skin and the veins showing it was so tissue paper thin and how they could be out in public and not detected at night and, uh, you know, all the stuff, you know. That makeup is a study in subtlety. Which one? Interview. Interview with Anne Yeah, it is. It, 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 yeah. And, and can you talk about the thought? Because it, it is very similar to the book, but how... What, what was the discussions like or the thought process that went behind all of that work? Um, well, the whole thing was to get that skin so translucent. And also, too, um, it was a makeup of like, um, like smoke and mirrors of magic, basically. Because if you noticed any of the makeup, then it was too much. And I think some of the HD stuff was coming in at the time. And so everything was very... Uh, had to be very subtle but luckily for me because of my years doing all the fashion stuff and all the makeover stuff that I did 
I knew how to do the kind of the no makeup look without uh, doing the subtleties. And also that foundation helped me greatly with prosthetic makeups because you learn the details and the subtleties, not just broad strokes and slapping stuff on. You learn the meticulousness of things and how to work quickly and get the job done. So uh, getting the skin translucent was really complicated. And also, uh, I decided at the, at the time, and it was a new thing because Real Effects was making these tattoo colors. And um, I did a mixture of the vein color, which was like a blue and a blue green and a kind of a maroon. And they made them custom blends for me at the time, which didn't exist so we could do the veins. And so I did a lot of practicing and I was over at Stan Winston's and he was involved with a lot of the looks and he had done sketches, so we were trying to copy the sketches. Follow, so we followed the veins on, the real veins that are on people's faces and then created more in the tattoo inks. And then I did many, many tests with different foundations and this and that, and one would wipe them off and another didn't stay, another showed up, it was too, too visible. And in the end, believe it or not, back to my old early days in makeup, I settled for Max Factor Pancake Natural Number One. So it just shows you uh, products. You've got to know products and how they work. It's not a matter of, oh, this is the new go-to hip thing. Know about everything. And the, the best way it went was I got the pancake with a sponge, like a white sponge, and made it kind of very nearly translucent. So if you're wiping it like that and you give it a rub, you can see that it's, you can see everything through it. So it was about doing layers, but putting it on and really buffing it. And the great part was it didn't knock the veins off because all the other makeups did. Uh, and it gave this beautiful translucent look. I mean, I, I can't describe it. Get some of, of it and just try it out. It's beautiful. And so, and then by buffing it just with hardly anything on a sponge to really make it part of the skin, we got the look. And then the rest was shading with a kind of um, a lavendery gray type color, very subtly and very subtle stuff, you know, the rest was. And of course the fangs, we placed them differently, the nails. So it was a makeup of details, veins in the hands, you know, very but subtle. But as long as I've known you, You've always, like you've always blended your own lipsticks as well, haven't you? I did at one point, yes. Yeah. I love, you see, I love mixing stuff and I love, I love finding out. And because of the early days, we made everything ourselves. We made our own glues. We made scar plastic. We made everything and anything we made. We, we made it because there was no way, other way. You know, you can't just, you couldn't go and buy a scar. You couldn't go and buy anything. Blood we made, you know. And so um, I did have a fascination with how do you do stuff, you know, and how how does it happen? And also, don't you think that some, in some way that's part of being a makeup artist? Is oh, yes. Like tinkering and... Absolutely. Playing with I things. I still do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. Well, I, you know, and the other thing too is um, it's very important to become an artist and to think like an artist. Don't just think, oh, I'm going to practice on myself or I'm going to be a makeup artist uh, and practice on a friend and just do stuff that you know by route. Go, go to museums, go study paintings and old artists and faces and photographs and see how people look and look at the shadows on their faces, look at the shape of their eyes, look at the color, lips, the shape of lips, skin tones especially. Just really get familiar with skin tones and maybe take up some art classes or sculpting classes. But the, I took up uh, oil painting and to this day I, I paint. And I did it mainly because I wanted to be able to, on a, three, on a flat canvas, create a 3D figure just by using light and shadow and color. And if you don't know how to do that on a flat white canvas, you will never master prosthetic and character makeup because you have to have the knowledge of that. How do you make something come out or how do you make something go in? You have to think about the shadows, the light, you know, a touch of warm beside a touch of cool. Uh, do you know your warm, cool colors? You know, all the things that are so important that an artist is 
using them like a musician would use music notes and make an, uh, an orchestra out of. You've got to know how to use color and light and shadows to create this. So if there's anything that you should learn is that and spend your time looking at pictures and looking and doing it. Get out a brush and get some paint and just keep trying it or take a class, you know. It'll be, you, you won't believe how it'll stand by you in the end, you know. All the rest, it won't matter. And, and I do know when I was hiring people, you know, because back in the old days, I hired many people who were not that qualified as makeup people, they just weren't. But what they did show me was their art or the fact that they could paint or do something on an artistic level. And I always looked for that more. I mean, I always asked them to bring me, you know, if you paint or sculpt or do something, please show me that work. Because if I saw a spark of any of that in them, I would hire them because I could, the rest is easy. You know, putting a foundation on, shaping this or that, that's easy. I'll give, you know, I mean, even on Clan of the Cave Bear when I was shooting up in Canada, um, none of the makeup people there did prosthetic makeups or anything like what I, I was asking them to do. And oh, I'm sorry, Cross for Fire and Clan of the Caber for that matter. And I would just uh, bring them in and give them a training session, like a makeup class in the trailer and show them how to do it. A, B, C, this is the foundation. And it was paint by numbers, literally. But the main thing was they were artistic enough to pick it up quickly and do it. You know, so they weren't accomplished makeup people at all. It was just that they had the ability to look at something and go, I can, I can mimic that. And that's what it's about, creating a character, is, is being able to do that. And then when you stand back, the actor is that character. That It's believable, you know. You were talking about great actors and great... Bram Stoker's Dracula, which you won yeah. your second Oscar for. Yeah. What was that like coming to that movie with Francis Ford Coppola, Gary Oldman, and the whole experience? And Aiko, who I know means yeah. so much to you oh, as yes. a person. Yeah. Can you talk about the experience of that movie? It was uh, it was like really um, a ride on the roller coaster, like with your hair flying back and you're clinging to the seat like this because every day was uh, chaos. And Francis likes to work in, in chaos with friction and discord. And he felt that you were super creative in that moment. And maybe he's right, but for me, it was highly stressful. <laughs> anyway, it worked, I guess. But the main, for me, the big excitement was working with Eiko. Eiko Ishioka is a Japanese designer. And she pretty much designed all the sets and props and costumes on Dracula. And she relied on me heavily for all the hairdo designs, including the old Dracula hairdo, and uh, the looks of those characters. And we worked very much in tandem. And she was, and we did the cell together too. And she, uh, she inspired me. I think she put me in, she, like you never stop learning when you're a makeup artist. You always must keep learning. But she gave me the quantum leap jump, a, a kind of a, a mini missing link really, because I remember saying to her one day, I said, Aiko, where do you get your inspiration from? Because, you know, I mean, she, she was coming up with these weird designs and outfits and one would look like a, a caterpillar, you know, um, I can't remember his name, and, and that ate the flies in the cell. Oh, um, uh, Tom Waits. Tom Waits, you know. And then I remember when the nuns were in the convent, you know, and they were, you know, I grew up at nuns, so I know all about nuns, they were black and white. And these had a taupe outfit, a kind of a taupey thing with this weird, like, thing on. And I remember saying to Aiko, we're standing on the set, I said, Aiko, why are the nuns in a taupe and white outfit and not black and white like nuns are? And she goes, Michelle, these nuns, and this is the nuns in Transylvania that take in Keanu when he got attacked by the brides, you know, and he's completely demented. And she said, these nuns, they live under the ground. They like mushrooms. And then I suddenly it dawned on me that she all her her inspiration came from creatures and uh, plants and objects and art. I mean, she just took ideas from everything and somehow made it her own. And it really opened up my eyes of like, wow, for inspiration, it can be anything, you know. With the old man hairstyle, oh, what, yeah. what was that based on? She, well, again, Aiko would always give me a mandate and, and Francis would as well. 
And sometimes what I did was designed around the costume, like, of course, because you've got to work with the costume and hair. It all is one, which is very important. You must not forget that. Uh, she had designed this huge red cape for this first beginning scene when she, he first meets, you know, welcome to my castle, you know, this yeah. whole scene. And so they wanted this scene to be very stunning. And Acorn Francis didn't know what he was, he was to look like. Greg Hanneman designed the face, but they wanted me to design the hair. And they said, we want something where East meets West because he's he's come all the way west but he's from the east he's this timeless character and so he's to look very different and also they wanted this Dracula to look like no other Dracula not the typical Hollywood Dracula with the fangs and the cape you know not like that so and especially when he was the old age Dracula he was to look so different so I came up with again inspiration from the Hopi Indians you know they have those weird horn hairdo things yeah. And also the kabuki, you know, look, which is this weird lacquered hair bun thing that they wear. And I thought if I did a kind of a combo of the two, it would look good. And so I did many sketches of ideas like that. And the one that you see in the film is, of course, the one that was selected. And I think if you look at my Instagram, I have a sketch that was the, the original sketches there. But the funny thing was the day... It, he was to wear that the first time everyone, like the unveiling, so to speak, of this look. The hair, the old age and the cape. No one had seen it because, you know, back in those days, most of the stuff, there was no makeup test or no big tryout. We just did it, you know. And this was the big day where Francis wanted to see the hands come across, the shadow of the hands first, and then Dracula, you know, the shadow of him. And then you see him. And... The crew's all there waiting. It's a big moment. Francis is going to come to the set as opposed to being in his Silverfish, which was this trailer that he often directed from, and he wouldn't even come to the set sometimes. But today he was going to come to the set. And I'm standing there with Aiko, and she's got this huge cape, you know, wads of costume and everything. And Gary has the hair on and the old age on. And we're all a bit nervous because I'm thinking, God, if they don't <laughs> like this... You yeah. know, I can get fired, you know, and this can be not good. And so he comes out on the stage and they're, they started shooting this. And I could hear whispers from some of the crew saying, oh, my God, he looks like Mickey Mouse. My stomach just dropped. I thought, oh, my goodness. You know, because you can't, when you work on a film, sometimes you can't, no one wants your character to look like an iconic character because, you know, Disney could come after you or there could be a yeah. something. And I thought, oh, I'm thinking with him, like, this is terrible. And Echo's beside me, and she's doing nothing. She's, like, looking, you know. And I go, Echo, do you think Francis likes this? And he goes, she says to me, he loves it. So then I thought, oh, saved, you know. But every day was heart in your mouth. You never knew what was going on, you know. And when you work with an actor like Gary, how detailed is he about the makeup? Oh, completely. Gary is... He could be your nightmare or he could be your joy as an actor because uh, you won't get off with anything. And he has laser eyes and he knows exactly what you're doing. And if one hair is out of place or you do something different from one day to the next, you know, you do someone every day, you've got to make them look. Anything, he uh, uh, catches you, you know. Oh, oh, stash, uh, uh, you know, he really notices everything, you know. And uh, But you're <coughs> like that too. But I'm like that too. Yeah, exactly. So did you both push each other, do you think? Oh, we did. Yeah, whole... I mean, oh, I loved Gary. We got along well. He's, he's, he's a makeup artist's dream. I mean, look at him on Churchill, Kazu. Oh, mm. it's beautiful, you know. Um, what was it like to win that second Oscar? It was, again, you know, it's funny. You always think, oh, this is great. I'm going to be wallowing in all the glory of it. It's wonderful. It's not. It's very raw because... At least for me it was, I, you know, because you, you feel you're not worthy. And then there was all the hoopla before when uh, they were trying to figure out whose name should be on the ballad and this and that. And I remember at one point they were thinking, oh, it should only be Greg because, you know, Greg did all the, he did the wolf creatures and all the real effect stuff. But, you know, the Academy honors 
all the makeup on a film. I mean, we, we look at everything. And the, the mandate is really with the Academy is if you took the makeup off the other characters, would you have the film? Well, you wouldn't. So really what I did and what I contributed, it didn't equal the, the amazing work Greg did, but it, was, it certainly was of the same value and mattered as far as an Oscar went. So, but one of the production managers, and I have to say, I did not like her that much. Um, she, or oh, I think it was her, but or somebody decided on a lot of the ads not to put my name up on it. And I was like completely dashed because I thought, well, after all the work we did and everything, uh, they're now going to just not acknowledge what I did. So I called up, I remember, one of the producers at Coppola's place, and I asked him, I said, are you not putting me forward? I said, what's, what's happening? And he said, of course we are. And he corrected everything right then and there. So there was that, you know, there was that agony. And then, of course, on the day of the Oscars, um, it went OK, I think. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, what's his name? Joe Pesci was there with Marissa Tomai, and they announced my name. He, called me Mike Burke. <laughs> so, all right, so, okay, great. And of course, I could tell he was drunk because by the time I got up on the stage, I could smell the, the waves of alcohol. So that was fine, and Marissa was so nice, she was terribly apologetic. And then, of course, this was Year of the Woman, and Greg spoke so long that, and I kept saying to Greg, please give me a moment to thank my crew because you, no, one, no one ever does anything on their own. You, you have a great crew. You know, and I said, please give me a moment to thank them. <clears throat> well, he got carried away and spoke so long that by the time I was just my moment to go oh, like this. And I remember looking out at the sea of faces, all famous faces, all looking like this <laughs> from the audience. It was so weird when you're looking down. It just took my breath away. It was overwhelming. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't speak to them. And then the music started to play. And I thought, but then I realized this is awful because I didn't get to thank them. But I did after. But you know, so it's 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 interesting. You're, there's a lot of stuff going on all the time, you know. And then I, uh, you know, I met Neil and I got my next job. And then we had to rush out of there because I was up my early. I had a four a.m. call or something the next day because I was on a film, you know. Because at the time Oscars were Mondays, you know. Wow, that's <clears throat> um, Austin Powers. What are the what's it like to work with Mike Myers? He is, again, like Gary, the ultimate actor perfectionist. But he really loves makeup and he relies on it. And, you know, when I head up a department, I always do the lead and design the makeup and make it, do it, and run the show and the whole bit. I mean, now people like to just be a personal or something, but I like to do everything. And, uh, it was great fun. I mean, every day we were laughing and joking, but serious too, because we had to actually pump out the makeups and do it really fast. And we had mini me, you know, like him. And uh, he played, you know, three characters. So there was all that to do and the changes. And um, it was different because he's a comedian. You know, comedians are kind of dark. When they're in the makeup, it was great. Mm -hmm. He's Austin and I call him Austin because it's much easier because he's so much fun as Austin. But then when he was Fat Bastard, he was in a foul mood because Fat Bastard, you know, so he became, it was very strange. It was like dealing with all these characters, you know. <laughs> so you got to know, I mean, when you work with an actor, you really have to have the proper bedside manner and you've got to really quickly know them and know what, some of them like to speak, some of them don't like to speak. And remember, we're just like the valet. We're, we're just background <clears throat> to make them look the part. We're not there for any other reason not to take pictures, not to be posting, using it as a post for Instagram or anything, just to do the work. And that is the most important thing. One of the movies you did was uh, Tropic Thunder and you did Tom Cruise as an iconistic, another iconistic character. Yeah. Well, that came together really fast though, didn't oh, it? Yes. Again, how oh, quickly yeah. did you put that makeup together? Well, again, you know, Tom, I worked many films with Tom as well, not just as his personal, but I mean, when any film he did that I did, I ran the whole show and did the leads and everything, design effects and everything. Uh, Tom doesn't like to spend time in the makeup. And so I think he gave us 55 minutes to put it together. Wow. So we had literally a SWAT team, everyone working together. But again, 
I designed this uh, prosthetic makeup, very thin silicone piece, literally a one piece that went over his face, hair punched in, pre-painted, so that when it went on, it was pretty much ready to go. You know, that's how quick it was. And the hands were these gloves, already hair punched in, you know, everything was pre, pre-made, pre-colored. But um, it was great fun. That film was great fun to work on. How <clears throat> You've talked a little bit. You have to be a very good makeup artist to be a person, I believe. You have to know everything. You have to be able to, because you really, you're working with them one on one, but yes. they don't really want other people around. Part of being a person is they don't want other people around, really, right? It's... Um, well, no, I think it's more just they, they feel at ease with you. <clears throat> they like, you know, they get used. It's like you have your doctor. You don't want to keep going to different doctors every time. You, you get comfortable. And also he knew that I could literally pull a rabbit out of the bag at any time, which was very important to him. And he relied on me for his look that he trusted that if I was going to come up with something for him, that it was going to work on screen because, you know, he, he the, you kind of hits and misses, you know, like on uh, Vanilla Sky, uh, the producers really didn't want that injured makeup on him because he said, oh, he's an iconic character. He can't look deformed or injured. And they threatened me. They said, like, if this makeup doesn't work, we're, we're not going to shoot the film. That's it. And so a lot of pressure is put on you to come up with what's needed and to think quickly and make it happen. And also, he doesn't want to spend time in the makeup chair. So I had to really uh, design the makeup so that it was quick, went on efficiently. And if I had to double team or triple team, I would put together people of the talents that were needed to help me. One would do hands, another would be fiddling with doing something with the hair, one this side, one this side, and we all had to work in tandem, you know. And quite often I would put a chart up on the mirror, you know, one so-and-so does this, two do that. Literally like short order cooks. And he'd sit there like this, oops, and then it would all just happen very quickly because uh, sorry, <laughs> and it just all happened very quickly, you know, and uh, that's what he expects. And it has to be perfect, you know. I mean, I remember on Vanilla Sky, he, we're, <clears throat> he's, he's there and the face is all, I don't know if you've seen pictures, the face is kind of like this by the time, you know, and he's looking at him and he says, Michelle, I can't go out looking like this, am I all right? And I said, Tom, you, you look perfect. And he goes, okay, you think I look perfect? I said, yes, Tom. I said, okay, but that's the kind of confidence you've got to instill. You've got to be sure of what you do and you have to know that it's going to look on camera. And, you know, sometimes I'm always very worried about the dailies or how's it going to look when we get on the set? Because sometimes it's okay one way in the trailer and then you get on the set and you see how they're lighting and suddenly you look at the monitor and going, oh, you've got to know how to quickly fix things. You know, I always had a little monocular and it really helped me zone in and sharply hone in on it. Get yourself one, they're wonderful. And really see all the details that you might see is something, you might have put a shadow too much, you might have <clears throat> missed out on something, you might have, you may need to punch a bit more color into the face, whatever. But you can quickly, and learn how to quickly correct. And again, your training in art and painting comes in because you can look with your eye and you go something's not right, it's it's too pale, it's too yellow, it's something. But you know then how to correct because, and if you don't know how to correct, then you're in trouble, you know. Uh, we've got time for one or two quick questions. Right. Michelle, in, ter in terms of working now, clearly you've got an amazing eye and you're, you're very good at, at interacting with people and supervising them. What do you, what do you, what, what, what do you struggle with? What, what is hard for you in terms of what you do? Oh, I struggle with everything. I mean, every film is like a new film, you know, and you never stop learning, you know. You never stop learning because things change, materials change so fast. Um, I've, I dealt with each film afresh, like it was a brand new thing, and I never resorted to the same old, same old makeups or techniques. Each one was a brand new one, and I tried to approach it with drawing upon my fount of knowledge, of course, and bringing it forward. So in the hopes that there's an evolutionary artistic thing going on for myself as well, you know. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> what advice would, 
speak it to uh, up and coming makeup artists? I know a lot of us are pretty young. What would you say? Oh, well, um, I think, as I said, <coughs> the main thing is to learn as much and never stop learning. Uh, network. <coughs> Sorry. Network a lot. Um, never be too egotistical, you know. Um, dress for the part. You're not the star when you come in. Dress clean and crisp. Don't wear sleeves to show your armpits and things. Um, I would say uh, don't eat garlic. And uh, don't uh, plaster yourself with perfumes and things because they can be offensive to people. And in the trailer, you've got to know how to uh, cope with everybody, regardless of their personality. You know, as you said, like the jerk in the corner, you've got to know how to deal with them. And be polite, diplomatic. Um, you've got to know a lot about your business and how to deal with that. And trust your group of friends, like create a little community around you and um, befriend other people and never be jealous of them or their successes and work and take everything that comes in, you know, and practice and learn and take photographs of your work and start getting out there and showing it to people because once per someone sees you and they sees, see what's necessary, they will want you. I mean, I was always kind of looking out for people with a little talent. Anyone that showed eagerness was much more important to me than saying, oh, I worked on this and on that. You know, sometimes people would come with very little work experience, but they showed a, a great amount of gumption when it came to uh, what they do uh, on an artistic level, you know. But um, that's kind of it, you know. I mean, uh, it, it's teamwork, learning how to fit in, people, people skills, you know, um, networking, and keep going, you know. Don't give up and mm -hmm. don't look at other people and say, oh, they, they do this and I'm this and poor me and all that stuff. You know, there's a lot of opportunities now. I mean, I know for me at the time, I don't know if there were more then or, or not, you know, because they didn't have makeup schools because there's more makeup schools now putting out makeup people. But with all the series and TV things that are happening and you have social media and there's so much there for you to do. So keep doing it. And the more you do it, the better you will become, you know. So that's the main I think. Oh, thing. we'll do one more. You'll be our last one. Um, what art inspires you the most? Oh, good question. What kind of art? Oh. I like, I mean, of course, I love, uh, even going back, I like Rembrandt and some of those artists that have really amazing, like, you know, Goya and stuff like that. But I love Picasso, you know, and I love Van Gogh. And I, what I see who else I love. There's a lot of just artists, do I see modern artists? I love all the Impressionists, you know. Um, I think also I, I like the Impressionists the most, you know, like, um, gosh, I can't think of their names now. But, uh, mainly because they, they they nearly paint like it's a little out of focus. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, there's something about it, like the, the colors, the way they blend and stuff. But I do always look to the Grand Masters too because of the skin tones and uh, Sargent is the one. Mm -hmm. he, he, I loved his stuff, the way he colors and the way he paints, really masterful, you know. But um, certainly people like um, Rembrandt and Cezanne and all these painters, just the way they paint skin and faces and use the way they use color, it's really beautiful, you know. It's been amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Will you spend a few minutes chatting with these guys afterwards? All right. Will you chat with these guys afterwards for a few minutes? Yeah. Thank you so much.